Aloha. What's up, everyone? It's me, Drew Manning, your host of the Fit to Fat to Fit Experience podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Always a pleasure to connect with you guys, and thank you for being here. Um, today, I have a special guest that is, is a very funny story of how I met him. I actually met him on a plane. We sat next to each other on the way back to uh, Arizona from Hawaii. He was sitting next to me. I usually never talk to people, <laughs> to be totally honest with you, but halfway through we kind of struck up a conversation and uh come to find out we found out that we're we have a lot of similarities and we kind of talk about the same things um and his name is ramsey bergeron um and <clears throat> like i said we connected on the plane and had a really deep conversation really engaging and i'm like man who is this guy and so i started to get to know him a little bit better uh he's a, a public speaker certified leadership and mindset coach skilled facilitator uh published author which we talk about his book, I believe it's called Cake on the Floor. And he told me about the whole concept of the book and how we, you know, react a certain way and how you react says a lot about you. And you know me, I talk a lot about reacting versus responding. And there's a difference between those two things. Um, And so anyways, he had me take this assessment after we had connected and exchanged numbers and um, started talking to each other. He had me take this assessment, which kind of talks about you as a leader and how you respond in stressful situations versus when you're not stressed out. And this assessment, I think, is a really powerful tool. And if anyone's interested, I'll put a link in the show notes to uh, take this assessment yourself. And he kind of coaches you through the results, which are really powerful and profound to help you see yourself uh, from a, a third party perspective of like, okay, how do I respond when I'm overwhelmed and stressed out versus how do I respond when I'm like my highest version of me. And it kind of sh- it shows you the difference between those two things. And it's really, really cool and powerful to understand how you make decisions in stressful situations and how that uh, impacts you negatively, um, which we all know we're not our best self when we're stressed out and overwhelmed. But he talks about certain areas of where you can improve and, um, and different uh, pers- how to gain a different perspective on certain situations. So the whole concept of cake on the floor, which is his book, we go into this in the podcast, but just briefly, he talks about how he was at a wedding. I think it was a DJ and the cake had, uh, the cake uh, that they were cutting into fell on the floor. And this girl just started instantly laughing, like just basically, you know, laughing about it or some people would be upset and, you know, uh, frustrated and um, really angry at the situation because they spent a lot of money on this. And and this person was able to respond by just laughing versus other people would be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, upset about it. And so that's kind of the whole concept of how to change your perception of certain situations. And I'm a big proponent of that. So I'm excited to introduce you guys to Ramsey. He's got a really, really interesting story. I think you guys will really enjoy this podcast episode. But before we jump into it, Definitely want to give a, a shout out to our, our show sponsored by Keon Aminos. And you've heard me talk about this supplement recently, which is essential amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks of protein. And they're super important, especially as you get older, um, <clears throat> to help build or maintain lean muscle mass. You know, I'm 43. A lot of you might be in your 40s or 50s. Um, and as you get older, it's super important to maintain as much lean muscle mass as you can as you age. Um, and that's one of the, the things we're fighting against is our muscles atrophying over time, which is naturally going to happen. But if you could slow down that process by taking essential, essential amino acid supplement, I think it's a um, it's an important supplement to add to your protocol. Um, some of the benefits uh, that you'll notice by taking Keon aminos that I've uh, noticed as well is, is your ability to build lean muscle. Um, enhance your athletic recovery. Like for me, I, I work out quite a bit and not being sore is really important so that I could perform my best um, and naturally boost energy. It's a great source of energy, not caffeine or anything like that. Um, it's stimulant free. It's completely sugar free. So you can take when you're fasting. Um, 100% vegan, um, derived from non-GMO plant sources. It's backed by over 20 years of clinical research and they have delicious flavors that I love. Um, clean, minimal ingredients, no junk or fillers, and it undergoes rigorous third-party testing. So if you're looking for an essential amino acid supplement, which is different than branched chain amino acids, um, go to getkion, G-E-T-K-I-O-N.com forward slash Drew. Use the code Drew. You'll get 20% off your order. 
um, check out their flavors. I like the watermelon flavor and uh, show them some love. So that's getkeon.com forward slash Drew, D-R-E-W, and you'll get 20% off. So go check it out. And uh, without any further ado, let's go hang out with Ramsey Bergeron. All right, Ramsey, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing today? Good, man. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's pretty uh, crazy how we met. If you don't mind me, I'll just I'll dive into that story, which is so interesting because I usually don't talk to people on planes. I really don't. Um, I'm kind of just in my zone. I either do some meditation or read a book or just kind of like stay in my own uh, space. But we were sitting on a plane uh, flying back to Hawaii, right? Or, fly, uh, or we were flying to Arizona. Yeah, we we're flying to Arizona, right? Yeah, from Honolulu. Yeah, yeah, from Honolulu, and I was uh, headed out there for an event, and we just happened to be sitting next to each other, and just started eventually chatting, and it was one of the deepest conversations I've ever had on an airplane, <laughs> and so I'm super grateful because now we're we've connected, and we realize there's some synergies there, and so I'm super excited to introduce you to my audience, and um, I just think it was pretty serendipitous how we met. So first of all, yeah, just introduce yourself a little bit about your background, your story. You know, what led you to this path that you're on now of what you do? So maybe tell us a little bit more about yourself, Ramsey. Sure. Thanks, Drew. My name is Ramsey Bergeron. I'm uh, based in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm a certified leadership and behavioral health coach, motivational speaker, mindset coach, and I help people change their perspective. If I had to really kind of nail it down, uh, started off, I had my own personal training business for 15 years. And I guess even going back a little further than that, the childhood, I got into personal training because my father died in his 50s from diabetes. And so I, I was 12 years old. Um, he had had both feet amputated from gangrene, went blind, was on dialysis three times a week. And I didn't want to go out like that. So I dedicated my life to my physical well being and became a trainer with a spokesperson for EAS Sports Nutrition. And then you know, I was focusing all of my energy into one element of my life, which was my physicality, but I was neglecting my mental and emotional well-being. So by the time I became, you know, an adult, uh, I, I realized, you know, this just isn't working, man. Something's just not right. I kept, I was only as good as the last race I did. I was only as good as my last accomplishment. And I was always feeling empty and it sucked. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, my best friend passed away. And it wasn't COVID. Oh, he drank man. himself into a coma and then died. Man, dude, sorry to hear that. Well, thank you. But that really is what motivated me to, to you know, can I say, get my shit together? Am I allowed to say shit? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. Because, you know, he was 42 years old, you know, and it made me think, what am I doing with my life, man? There's no guarantees. So mm -hmm. I went back to school, uh, became certified coach at that point. And as you know, most of, training is coaching anyway because everyone knows they need to eat better and move more yep. but why aren't they yes and so i'd be kind of unofficially doing that for a while and then in 2020 i just i pivoted and went into this full time and got stopped personal training and uh never looked back it's really interesting to hear about your evolution because it's very similar to i'd say mine in certain ways and, and other people's uh, evolution or journeys as well because maybe at first because what happened to your dad which would be, you know, as a 12 year old little boy, that must have been really hard for you. I'm sure that, you know, affected your, you know, mentality, your mindset, a certain direction where you're like, hey, I need to focus on my physical health. Let me get certified as a personal trainer. Let me learn how to take care of my physical body, which, yes, can get you so far in life. But then, then 2020 happened, and what happened to your friend led you to realize that, hey, the work isn't done just taking care of my physical health. Because, <laughs> Like, like I said, that will only get you so far. And then you had something tragic happen where it's like, hey, this mental health thing, there's something there that I need to explore and need to work on. And I think other people go through a similar evolution where it's like they come into the fitness uh, industry like, okay, I want to transform my body. I need to change my health for whatever reason. Maybe they had a similar experience like you or they saw a picture that they just like, I need to change. And they think, okay, I'm just going to change my physical health. Maybe that will fill this void. And then they realize even if they do get the body that they want, it's not enough. Like it's still, there's still something missing. And then they go on this other path of maybe mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, in a sense, to kind of fill those gaps. And it sounds like you kind of had a similar <clears throat> journey where, you know, the physical health journey wasn't the thing that maybe you, you were missing or trying to fill that void. There was more to it. 
and you learned that. So, so how did you pivot exactly? And what did that look like going from being a personal trainer into becoming like what you are now a mindset coach? Well, one of the things that, that I, I tell my clients it's whenever I do my, my presentations and I talk about shifting yeah. mindsets and how we're showing up, it's funny because I can see people in the audience look over and, or look them up afterwards and say, man, I wish my husband was here that he could hear this. <laughs> yeah. And I always say, what about, what about you? You know, because so many people can think of someone, maybe even listening to this podcast, they can think of someone who they think should listen to this, but they're not thinking about how they can change their lives possibly. And yeah. so the first thing that I needed to do if I was going to be of any help to anyone else is figure out my stuff, is face my demons. Mm -hmm. And so going back to school, like in 2020, you know, when COVID hit, I live in Arizona, the weather's great. I built a gym in my yard. I'm like, all right, gyms okay. are shut down. The weather's consistent. So I trained people in my yard for a year and a half while going back to school to, to get certified in coaching. And in that process, you know, I, I learned that it's, it's, not, it's not what we do. It's why we do it yep. and understanding that, understanding the why, and, and I'm sure people, it, it's, you're only going to be as successful as the strength of your why and knowing what the real why even is. Yeah. Yeah. I think understanding the why is super important. I think some people, it evolves over time. Like at first it's like, oh, I don't know why I just want to get in shape because that's the way I've been programmed, right? That's what society tells me I need to do. So I'm just going to go with the flow and do what everyone else is doing. And then I think as you get to know yourself on a deeper level, you peel back the layers, you do some inner work, you start to realize, well, may maybe there is, there's something deeper there of like why I want to eat healthy food and why I want to be physically healthy. And that's where, you know, that, that deeper understanding of, of why you really want to do this is one that sticks. Because I think at first people really don't dig deep enough to really figure out what the why is. Um, until they peel back the layers and understand themselves on a deeper level to know like, hey, this is who I am and this is how I want to show up in this life. And to show up in this life, this has to be my purpose. And this is my purpose of why I want to show up and eat healthy food. So I love that advice. Let's back up a little bit. And I really want to like maybe get started with your book because the, the book and the concept of the book, when you were explaining it to me on the airplane, just really intrigued me and really hit home with all the points that you were talking about because this is exactly the the power of shifting your perception and you do such a good job of structuring and organizing in a way that's so digestible and presentable to your average person because it, when some when you know what's it called the cake when or cake, cake on, on the, the floor, floor. <laughs> cake yeah. on the floor he'll explain what this is but when that happens looking at it through a few different options of like okay i can either look at it this way look at it this way or look at it this way it's very simple so maybe talk about the book how that got started what it's about and maybe do a deep dive really quick into that. Sure. So, uh, you know, as a personal trainer, I was moonlight at like three other jobs at the same time. And, and one of them yeah. was I was a DJ for 20 years. I was a wedding DJ. Oh, wow. So, so I was DJing a wedding here in Arizona a little over a decade ago. And the bride went to cut the cake. And it was like this beautiful five-tier cake. And the venue didn't lock the legs of the cake table out all the way. So this cake falls all over the floor. 300 guests freeze. And I'll stare at the bride and the bride started dying laughing. And then everyone in the room started laughing and it became a very memorable part of the night. Yeah. That could have gone very differently. You know, a lot oh, yeah. of times whenever I start even telling this story, people, when I say that the venue didn't lock the legs of the table out, people are like, oh man, like they see where this is going. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that she laughs, you know, and, and whenever I'm working with clients, I let them know that there's always cake on the floor. You know, that cake on the yeah. floor is a divorce. The cake on the floor is a, a cancer diagnosis. It's losing your job. It's, it's something, it's getting a flat tire. It's anything yeah. in your life that happened that you didn't want to happen. What do you have control over? And at the end of the day, the only thing you have control over is how you respond. Yeah, it, it, it's so true. And I think this is where you know, understanding the built-in programming and the subconscious mind of the way we're wired to respond, right? Which maybe comes from parents' behaviors that you maybe just have kind of, you know, inherited from them, siblings, coaches, teachers, religious leaders, movies, TV shows, kind of all a, a culmination of that. Uh, and our brain is calculating this situation of how we should respond at that moment. And then you step into the conscious mind, where this is kind of what you explain, uh, you know, teach people how to do is take a step back instead of just being reactive, how to thoughtfully respond as maybe your higher self. Like this was an awesome reaction from the bride because we've seen a lot of 
like Bridezilla TV shows and movies where this could have gone really wrong and she could have started crying and the whole night could have been ruined if she chose kind of that reactive subconscious programming, but instead was able to just like look at it for what it was and be like, you know what? It's just cake. It's cake on the floor. <laughs> and it, at the end of the day, it's funny. And then because she laughed, it gave everyone else permission to laugh and be like, oh, this was just a silly thing. This wasn't the end of the world or, you know what I'm saying? And and we don't yeah. need to judge people who do react that way because I'm sure they've had experiences that have like led them to that point of like, this is an important thing. And now my life is ruined because I've had those moments too, where like I react to a flat tire or I react to, you know, um, something that's inconvenient that's outside of my control that I just don't want to deal with. Right. And I think we all have to face that reality of sometimes we react to not our best self. And that's, I love maybe, I would love for maybe you kind of talk about, okay, how does someone go from that subconscious programming, which is just kind of like a reactive, like you don't even really think about it. It's already, it's there to pushing pause and thinking about it and like, and then choosing which direction you want to go in. How does one get to that point? Well, the first step is to buy my book, Cake on the Floor, which you can make it on Amazon. But the 20,000 foot view is learning the difference between reacting and responding. Because okay. like, like you're mentioning, Drew, reacting is that automatic, unconscious, um, I don't want to think about it as lizard brain, because you're right, it's generally yeah. conditioned. It comes yeah. from a place of ego. And most of us spend our lives on autopilot, where mm -hmm. we're not even thinking. Uh, there's a Zen saying about a guy on a horse riding as fast as he can. And someone else says, where are you going? And the guy says, I don't know, ask the horse. And that's how most of us are living our yeah. lives. We're not, we're not intentionally designing how things go. Mm. So let's say that the metaphorical cake hits the floor. If you're yep. wanting to learn how to respond, um, I, I always defer to the quote from B Victor Frankl in A Man's Search for Meaning. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Amen. And for those of us oh, over 40, thank you. For those of us over 40 that remember the Choose Your Own Adventure books back in the day, where it's like, all right, if you want to do yeah. this, turn to page eight. If you want to do that, turn to page 40. Yep. That's our life. The yep. problem is we're not choosing how to respond. We're just kind of going with it. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is so important, Drew, this literally determines your entire life. Because at the end of your life, you're gonna leave a legacy, whether you want to or not. They're gonna say something about you. Yep. The difference between reacting and responding is literally the difference between your legacy being determined by design or by default. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's so true. Uh, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, and that's kind of where I've come to realize is that stepping into the conscious mind and choosing you know, how you want to respond, learning how to create space, is so valuable at this stage in my life, especially with me, you know, personally having two teenage daughters and it's very easy to be reactive. And, um, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of like uh, practice to, to be in that responsive mindset where I'm like, okay, think about it, push pause, don't just react. Cause when you react, it kind of, you know, you, you tend to not show up your best self, especially if you've been sleep deprived, you're stressed out with finances, you're stressed out with your relationships, you're stressed out with, whatever it is you're going through in life, it's so easy to let that stress carry over into the reactivity of your kids being innocent, right? And like situations where maybe an accident happens, it wasn't their fault, but you just react in a certain way. And it has nothing to do with the event that just happened in front of you, it has everything to do with the thousand other things that overwhelmed you that got you to that point where now you just like, you know, about to explode and like everything is, is too much and overwhelming. And so you react out of place of being hurt or, you know, sleep deprived and you're not your best self in those moments. Getting to that place where you're able to thoughtfully respond, push pause, create space is being able to step into that highest, most healed version of you to think about, okay, you know, choose your adventure, which path do I want to take? And it takes practice. It takes time. It's like building a muscle. It's not like all of a sudden day one, you're going to go in and be like, yep, I'm in control. I'm, I'm going to thoughtfully respond to everything. And this is what I see with people with diet and exercise too. When I try and help someone overcome patterns and behaviors that might be addictive towards food or emotional eating or self-sabotage, they try and just willpower their way into healthy eating and willpower their way into exercising every day. But as we know, we're, we're as humans, we're emotional creatures. And it's really hard <laughs> to you know overcome those emotions in the heat of the moment when we're so pulled towards like, 
pizza and ice cream or processed junk food instead of, you know, healthy, like a healthy salad or something when we know that's better for us. But in the moment, we're so stressed and overwhelmed from all the life stuff we're dealing with that sometimes it's easy to gravitate towards, you know, the path of least resistance, the programming of like, well, that food does make me feel better. And maybe I need a break today so I don't, you know, punch my kids. I understand. I have so much empathy for people that struggle with transformation because I, I understand better how the, the the human psyche works in these situations. It just it takes time for someone to build that self awareness, and so maybe maybe talk about building self awareness, and then I want to talk about this assessment that you had me do. But I, let's dive into like how does one become self aware? What's some like methods that they can do to become more self aware of, you know, that reactivity that maybe they're not even aware of why they do what they do? Great question. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to misattribute the quote, so I'll, we'll make sure. sure we put it in the show notes. But That's okay. You've done great so far with your quotes. <laughs> so, Well, someone, uh, I can't remember, Tasha, I can't remember her last name. She's a doctor and she studied self-awareness. And 95% mm. of people think they are self-aware mm. when the reality is only 10 to 15% are. <laughs> and it's one close. of those, you, we don't know what we don't know. So- yeah. The, the first steps to develop self-awareness is um, slowing down and just gaining awareness of your thoughts and feelings. And I, one of the key things I start to do with my clients is tell them, one, you are not your thoughts, and two, you are not your feelings. You're the observer of your thoughts and feelings. Very Eckhart Tolle Amen. power now. And once you can begin to observe your thoughts and feelings objectively, you can then decide is this thought lying to me? Because most of our thoughts are lying to us, you know? I agree. And because and thoughts think themselves, they just pop in our head. Now, it's mm -hmm. up to us to decide whether we give a thought power or not. And so one of the exercises yeah. I talk about in the book is asking ourselves, is it a fact or is it a judgment? Because facts do not create strong emotion. Emotions yeah. come from a judgment of a fact. So I can say, my father died from diabetes at 56. Fact. Yeah. Uh, I'm predisposed to be diabetic because I'm more insulin resistant fact. Well, diabetes runs in my family. I've got no choice. I'm going to be overweight. That's a judgment. That's not yeah. fact. I might have to work harder, but I can be, um, I don't have to fall into, those, into that same trap. So yeah. to, to begin, to begin self-awareness, mindfulness and meditation is such an important thing. And if you'd have told me five years ago that I was meditating, I would say, nope, I don't have, that's too woo woo. That's hippie shit. I don't have time for that. Yeah. And I find now because I meditate, I have much more time because I'm focused um, with one task at a time and I'm much more effective. You're 40% less effective when you multitask. Yeah. So when you slow down and you're aware of your feelings, like, oh my gosh, I want to I wanna eat ice cream right now, for example. Yeah. Well, do I really want to eat ice cream right now? Or have I been conditioned? Because as a kid, my parents rewarded me with sugar. And so yeah. I now equate sugar with feeling good because it's a reward. And, and if I can understand that, Instead of scolding my inner child saying, no, 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 don't want sugar. That's like saying, don't think of the pink elephant. Yes. I condition my clients to say, it's okay that you want sugar. It makes sense that you want sugar, but it's not in my best interest right now yep. because we align our, when we align our goals to our values, then we're much more likely to stick with them. Amen. It's, it's so true. And that's where like, you know, letting go of that judgment. And that's, what's really hard is, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years of, thinking this way of judging these thoughts and these feelings and, and attaching meaning to them instead of sitting back and thinking like, Hmm, why do I want the ice cream? Like, or why do I always reach for the ice cream or the alcohol in these moments, in these situations? And I think the other part of self-awareness that I would throw in there is getting curious to become the observer. And as you get curious about like, Oh, I wonder why I do this pattern instead of like, I hate that I do this. I hate that I self-sabotage. I hate that I emotionally, eat. I wish that part would just go away. There's not a lot of room for for growth there because you're just going to continue to shame yourself and beat yourself up for thinking that way. But you're human. You're 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 here as a human, to, and you're going to have those feelings and emotions. It's learning the ability to be aware of them, feel them, but not let them consume you and you know derail you from where you want to go in life. And that's that takes time. That's an art form that needs to be learned over time of of like observing, feeling it out letting it pass through you and then making a, a decision from a place of uh, response instead of reactivity. And that right there is like, like so key. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it's so important. And, and like, that's why, like, you know, when I bring up mindfulness or meditation, 
yeah, it, it, it directly has nothing to do with weight loss, but indirectly how you think about everything you're putting in your mouth and being an intentional of like, why do I want to eat this food? Or why do I not want to eat this food? Or why do I want to skip the gym? Or why do I want to go to the gym and just learn to be intentional about every decision you make is there's power in that. And I think that's where people can really start to see some serious transformation, whether it's physical transformation or mindset as like a high performing CEO or executive that is trying to better their life, which I'm sure is a lot of your clientele. It's a similar, um, it's a similar method to, to work through whether you're someone that's trying to lose weight or you're someone that's trying to break old, old thought patterns and loops that you get stuck in because it's all relatively the same. It just manifests in different forms. One person might be addicted to drugs or alcohol or, you know, whatever it is. And other people might be addicted to food or sex or porn or social media. It's, it's similar mechanisms in our brain, whether, you know, no matter what it manifests as. So I, I love that, Ramsey. If you don't mind, um, I really am curious to dive into this assessment that you had me take because when you pitched it to me, or not pitched it to me, that's not the right word. When you told me about it on the plane, I was very intrigued, but it sounded at first like another personality test, but everything you're talking about is the stuff that I kind of teach my clients. And so that's why when you told me about this assessment, I really trusted, you know, I, I really trusted you, first of all, because of, of the way you explain things is very similar to how I explain things to my clients. And so that's why I was like, okay, I got to go through this. So maybe talk about the assessment, how it works, what it does. And then maybe we could go over some of the results that I had, because I think that would be very cool for people to kind of see exactly, like put it into practice of like how this actually works. Yeah, well, and thank you, and thank you, Drew, for being open enough to take it, because uh, sure. you know it could be, it's really kind of raw to be able to take this. You know, a lot of the other assessments are aptitudinal assessments, which tells you what your strengths are, what you might be good at. You know, the DISC, Strength Finder, Hogan, all of those. This assessment is called the Energy Leadership Index Assessment, or ELI. And it was created by Bruce Schneider and the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching. And what it does is it shows you your energy on a regular day, how you're showing up, how you view the world. Because we all see the world through a lens. And that lens mm -hmm. is the culmination of, like you said, our past experiences, my upbringing, my religion. And then it shows us what happens to our energy when we encounter stress. Yeah. So some people, like the bride who laughed at the cake on the floor, she handles stress differently than the bride who might have said my wedding is ruined, or who might have gotten angry and blamed yeah. someone else for the wedding being ruined. Or you can have a bride say, hey, wait here, I'm going to go get more cake because that bride wants to be of service. Yeah. So there's actually seven different ways you can respond in different situations. And this assessment really shows you where you tend to default when you encounter stress. Yeah. And I love that you brought that up because like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's, there's different ways when we're reactive. Like I said, we don't really show up our best self. And when we're stressed out, understanding yourself in those moments, I think is super important to build that self-awareness versus those moments when you're, let's say you're, you, you know, you slept well last night, you've been eating well recently, you've been exercise, you've been exercising, you've been taking care of your, your mindfulness and you, you're able to show up differently. Th those are almost like two completely different versions of you. And this assessment really allows you to see yourself in both of those lenses of like, okay, what do I do when I'm stressed out versus what do I do when I'm not overwhelmed? And so maybe to walk people through like the, the process a little bit. And then maybe if you don't mind, we can bring up some of my results. I don't mind, you know, showing people, <laughs> you know, some of my results. All right. As so, long as you don't mind. So the process yeah. in regards to taking the assessment, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So the assessment's 85 questions that range from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And then it just kind of shows you the two different charts, right? You got one chart that shows you your energy on a regular day and one chart that shows you when you're stressed. And right now I'm fighting my stress reaction because as soon as we started the podcast, my landscaper showed up and my dogs are going ape shit right now. So you can hear him barking. It's me. And my, I'm in my stress reaction right now. It's like, of course, of course, right now is when this happens. That's okay. I have renovations going on, so it's the same over here. <laughs> like, all right, stay calm. Don't react. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I digress. So after yeah. you take the assessment, then okay. I'll send you the results, but only about two days because I it really, I need to be able to run through with you what they mean because it's not yes. very intuitive to understand what they are on their own. Yeah, but once 100%. I explain it, then it all begins to make sense and come together. Let's go over. Uh, let's go over some of the results and see and see just so people can kind of see what mine look like. I'm not embarrassed to show what my results are. All right, let me pull up. Uh, I'll I'll share on the screen here. 
Yeah, let's do it. This stuff's really cool, by the way, everyone. As he's pulling that up, it's super informative to understand myself on a deeper level. And and the other thing that you mentioned is like it does kind of change or evolve over time, right? Let's so do taking this assessment, what like once a month, once a a couple times a year. Sorry, not once a month, but once a year, twice a year. So you can take the assessment every six months. So every six every months six with months. clients I'm working with on a regular basis, I'll have them take okay. it again. But these yeah. these are your results. Okay, so the top chart is you on a regular day. And the bottom chart is you and you encounter stress. <laughs> Completely so, different. Very different. All right. And, yeah. you know, we'll talk a little bit about, I didn't talk about there's two different kinds of energy, anabolic and catabolic. All right? Yeah. Maybe describe what those are. That's, I think that's important. All right, so anabolic, anabolic energy is constructive. It's building. It's coming up with solutions. It's one we can think of as like either being in a flow state or getting things done. From a fitness perspective, the word anabolic is used because it's building tissue. Right. So anytime we're in a building stage, we're in anabolic energy. Now, catabolic is a tearing down process. So catabolic uh, is think about it like fight or flight mode. So sure. if I'm yep. being chased by a bear, my body's going to release cortisol into my bloodstream to break down tissue to help me outrun the bear. Now, that's fantastic if I'm being chased by a bear. But yep. what happens is if it's like, oh, my God, I've. I've got a date tonight. I haven't lost the weight that I've wanted to lose. And we start freaking out. It doesn't really yeah. do us any good. But 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 catabolic energy serves a purpose. If I'm being chased by yeah. a bear, I want it. The problem is people think I don't want any catabolic energy. I just want to be happy all the time. And I don't know when I'm dealing with my clients now, they're like, oh, I just want to be happy. It's like, well, emotions fade. Emotions are yeah. all transient. And so if your goal is to be happy you're going to fail because it's impossible to continuously feel an emotion forever. So what we have here, the, the first two levels are pure catabolic, and then it kind of goes up. The even levels are feeling levels. The odd levels are thinking levels. So okay. your primary level here, Drew, is a four. You like to be a service. You like to put other people's needs ahead of yours. You yeah, sacrifice to make sure true. that, what's that? I said that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Well, and then you sacrifice to help take care of other people. So three of your highest levels, uh, you are a four, three, five, going in order from highest to you know second to third levels, yep. okay? Now, two of those are thinking levels. Three and five are both thinking levels. So you're a thinker, but you yep. think to solve problems to help other people when you're not stressed. When you are stressed, you come down here to this bottom chart. And level one is the level of overwhelm or guilt. We either, yep. we, I, 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 I signed out for too much. I can't possibly do it all. Or we're like, man, why did I do things this way? I should have done things differently. And we're stressed. And then our ability to help other people or solve problems goes completely out the window. That is so true. Can I just chime in here really quick? Because I, I've, I've opened up to you and told you a little bit about certain life situations that I'm going through right now. And a lot of, I know a lot of my followers have kind of seen some social media posts about like stuff I'm going through and I haven't really open open about it just yet. Cause I'm still going through it. I'm still like not all the way through just yet, but it does affect me when I'm feeling those feelings of overwhelm. I shut down, I go inwards. I'm not as responsive to people. I kind of just like suffer silently within and I'm not able to serve or give to others. Like I, I'm a giver naturally, but in these moments of overwhelm, I shut, I shut those parts down. And yeah, that, that chart right there is so true because of what you know, some of the heaviness of the stuff that I'm going through um, makes me show up that way. And so I'm aware of this. And there's only certain things that are super heavy that trigger me into those states. Uh, for the most part, I'm able to, you know, move through it and not let it consume me. But there's certain things in this life <clears throat> as a dad, you know, as a human that I just like I, the overwhelm of it is is pretty heavy. Like there's certain things that get to me is what I'm saying. So I want, I want everyone to understand that that we all have certain levels. And like, let's say six months ago or six months from now, I take this test again and my life's in a different place, that those, that chart would probably show up differently, right? That's what kind of what you're saying, Ramsey. It will show up differently. I just want to give people some, some context. Yeah, so the, 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 another way that this is very different from some of the other assessments is this will change based on where you are in your life and the kind of inner work you're doing. Right. Like if you're taking a disc assessment, if you're a high I, odds are you're always going to be a high I barring some huge change. Yeah. But yeah. this this really is very indicative of where you are and your perceived level of choice in situations. I, I do want to point out, though, Drew, 
that mm-hmm. levels one and two, even though they're catabolic, again, they do serve a purpose. If I see someone that has Amen. no level one, the bottom chart, level one, again, it, it could be feeling of guilt or overwhelm. But if I mess something up, I feel bad. I have a conscience. And so if I'm working with someone that doesn't have any level one, they tend to maybe have some sociopathic tendencies possibly. Like, I don't care. I don't care if I hurt people. I don't care if I screw up. Ah. So it, it, it can serve as a conscience. It can also, um, if we lose something close to us or if we're struggling, it'll rally our friends and family around us. Our tribe, so to speak, will pick us up. Like if we have a death yeah. in the family or lose a pet or go through a divorce, it can really help us um, attract people in to, to help us out and be there for us. I think really quick, I also want to like the thing that I love about this assessment is you're not labeling as any of these as good or bad, because what you just mentioned, like level one's catabolic, it's not bad. It comes at a cost. Everything, every level here isn't bad or good. It just, they all come out with a cost. So you're kind of showing like, hey, here's the benefits of being at this level. Let yourself be at this level if that's where you're at. Just realize the cost that it comes with. And that goes for all the good, like quote unquote, good levels as well they come at a cost as well. And you do a really good job when he breaks this down for you, you guys of like each level, you might be judging yourself like, Oh, I'm level one. That's catabolic. Like, why do I do that? It serves a purpose. It's there. And I think this carries over into how I coach people sometimes to have compassion for those parts of you that maybe you wish you you didn't have like, Oh, I wish I wasn't like this, or I wish I wasn't like that. And we tend to hate those parts of us that react a certain way, but those parts for at some point in time served a purpose to help you survive to keep you alive right so that they they that part of you that maybe now you hate was there at some point in time to like help you get through a situation that required that type of catabolic energy it just it comes at a cost where now that you're in a different place you know it, it, it it's maybe not serving you now where you're at so learning to let it go is kind of where the magic happens and that's where you can kind of be free of it but not labeling it or judging yourself as good or bad because you know i'm a level one so you do a really good job of explaining that to people so people aren't i think judging themselves or being hard on themselves does that make sense it does and there's two points i kind of want to make there drew thank you for that sure. the first one is when you say let it go i i always reframe that to let it be mm. and the reason i do that let it go is because like let it go don't think about it pretend it doesn't <laughs> exist Good is point. the connotation I, I hear let it go let it be to me is like no let it be it's, it is it simply is i don't have to i don't have to wish it away it, yeah. it, it it's it's there and the other point i wanted to make is i always whenever i do my my keynote presentations or workshops if you if your audience only writes one thing down that i share let it be this okay. instead of self-improvement focus on self-compassion instead of oh, self-improvement that's deep Thank you. And because whenever we like to your point, Drew, whenever we, we shame ourselves, like, oh, I'm so stupid. Why am I catabolic? And we shame ourselves yeah. for, for having shame already. We tend to spiral. Yeah. But if we focus on grace and, and the hardest line you will ever walk is between accountability and grace. And for those mm-hmm. people that are type A like you or me, man, we are heavy on the accountability and we're real light on showing ourselves grace sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And whenever we do, whenever we're allowed to say, you know what, I'm a human being. That's okay. What can I do now? And mm-hmm. this, especially when we're talking about people who want to get in shape, again, it's a fine line of like, it's okay that I ate the ice cream. Yeah, but you, we also ate it yesterday and the day before and the day before, right? So we can't, like finding that balance and then finding the underlying issue, like, okay, I'm wanting a lot of ice cream. Why am I wanting a lot of ice cream? Because you can't just tell yourself, don't want ice cream. You know, it's like, it's okay that I want, what can I do instead? I think that's a powerful reframe is what can I do or what do I want instead? Yeah. And I think that's really important to talk about Ramsey because I think a lot of people confuse self-compassion, self-love with having the ice cream every night because you're going through some hard times and there's a time and place for that. But if it's happening every night, getting curious about, okay, why is this happening every night? Why am I wanting to do this every single night? And we all know that, you know, you can't, you, you could both things can be true. You can have compassion for yourself and love yourself and also do the hard things that are necessary to improve your life. Those can exist in the same in the same at the same time. And I think that's important to, for people to realize it's not an either or. If I love myself, <clears throat> I won't push myself. I won't, you know, do hard things. And I think the ultimate 
act of self-love is in doing the hard things because those hard things in the moment, yes, it might feel like a punishment or a chore, but we know and we're mature enough now to understand that those hard and comfortable things are what bring the long-term fulfillment and happiness in the long run. So we're doing this for our future selves, knowing that the short-term discomfort is there to serve a purpose to help us you know, become that better or, or more healed version of ourselves in the long run. And we're, we're, we're worthy of that. And, and we, we love ourselves enough to do the hard and comfortable things. And sure, there's a time and place where it's like, you know what, I've worked out six days this week. My body's really sore. Maybe I should listen to it and just stay home and stretch. And, you know, maybe I'm okay with having some ice cream tonight. It just de it depends on the situation. I think coming down to setting an attention of like, okay, why do I want to eat the ice cream? Is it to escape? Is it to reward myself? Is it to numb the pain of the, the what I'm experiencing in life? Is it to distract myself from the pain? Like, what is your intention with wanting to eat it? And just being honest with yourself. Like, yeah, screw it. I had a hard day. I'm eating ice cream and I'm being intentional about it. And and not judging yourself, not shaming yourself for doing it, just saying, this is what I'm doing. And and just being honest and intentional about it. And then the next time you can be like, okay, is that something I want to do every night? Probably not. So in the next time, the next time that that comes up for me, you know, working through those emotions so that I don't, you know, get consumed by those emotions where I'm reactive to them and go for the ice cream. Does that make sense? I think there's a difference there. It, it does make sense. There is a difference there. And I think like, most of our ills, most of our deficits come from the inability to sit with our emotions. And, and if we want to, we, we don't want to feel this. We don't want to be in the present moment. We want to yeah. change our emotional state. So we've used ice cream, food, food porn, sex, drugs yeah. to, to self-medicate, to not feel whatever it is we're feeling. And, mm -hmm. that, and to do that is, is to deny reality. Because the emotion's going to come back, right? I always equate it like, all right, back you know when I was single and in college, oh, dirty room, everything just goes in the closet. Just going to stuff everything in the closet, clean up. That, that's my, that was yeah. my version of cleaning. Well, eventually, go. that closet door is going to snap off the hinges and everything is going to pour out. That's how our emotions are. And that's why sometimes, whether it's us or someone else, will, there'll be a large emotional reaction that we feel might not be warranted based on like, where the hell did that come from? Well, it didn't come from this instance. It's been building and building and building. And yeah. whenever we're, we're, we start for any kind of um, health or wellness journey, I think it's important. And this, this applies to like you're talking about anything from CEOs. It really applies to anything. If we're so focused on that checkbox, that the, the outcome of, yeah. I want to be 10% body fat, or yep. I want to finish a marathon in four hours that we're no longer enjoying or appreciating the journey to get there. Because what happens once we hit 10% body fat? Are we going to go back to eating bullshit all day? Yeah. It's, 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 there's a saying that I love and it's the man who enjoys walking will always walk further than the man who enjoys the destination. So if you enjoy, if you enjoy learning about yourself, like, like viewing life as curiosity, like, huh, what would it? What would it be to be my fittest self? Let me try some things instead yeah. of, no, I have to be fit. I've got to be down 40 pounds for this. It's a mm. whole different mindset of enjoying the journey. And that's kind of where the reframing that like the shifting someone's perspective of the journey, because a lot of people see it as a process or sorry, as a punishment or a chore. And if they could learn to fall in love with the process, then they could, you know, they could go like they could accomplish so much in life because they're, they're learning to fall in love with the process. And, you know, with anyone that falls in love with the process, the results are going to come as a byproduct because you're just like enjoying the process so much. Now, what I'm saying is you don't need to like, oh, I love exercising or I love eating broccoli over cake. It's, it's the process of getting curious about it. Like, oh, this is interesting. I actually sleep better. I have better sex. I have better energy. I have better focus. I have you know, better skin, um, you know, whatever it is, I'm a better parent, I'm a better employee when I take care of my physical health and I'm doing all these things, um, just coming to that realization instead of like, like you said, I got to get to this point, I got to get to this destination and, you know, the process is going to suck. And if I don't get the results, then I'm just going to not do the process anymore. And so yeah. many people fall into that trap, whether they're entrepreneurs or, you know, on a weight loss journey, and it, we, we see it time and time again of like loving the destination more than the actual walking and the process. Yeah. And I, I think a, a large part of it is, is the stories we tell ourselves, right? Like we, if, if we, 
if they were to make a movie about your life, whoever whoever's listening to this right now, they're gonna make a movie about your life, who would you cast as you in that movie? And then how ben would Stiller. you tell them what's that? Ben Stiller. I get I, I I said Ben Stiller because I get that all the time that people think I look like Ben Stiller. But sorry, go ahead. I thought the same thing. I was gonna ask if you had a, a Globo Gym franchise, but <laughs> Globo Gym. you know, um but, love it, man. So but let's yeah. say then, Drew, that you're on set and there, and there's a scene with Ben Stiller. He's playing you in a scene with the kids. How would you tell yeah. Ben Stiller to act in that scene to be you? Wow, that's interesting. Oh, man, that's really interesting. Yeah, that, that makes me think. <laughs> like, because what, cause what we don't man. realize is there is a movie about you. And guess who's yeah. playing you? You. Yeah. yeah, and we don't think about what, what do we want to do to show up, and and to, to help reframe for people is you know I had a client who he's a people pleaser helping everyone all of his life, and I go man you best you must have been helping people your whole life and putting them first huh? He goes yeah it's the story of my life, and I'm like doesn't have to be you True. know, and so for people who identify with themselves as out of shape, people who that becomes their identity is being the heavy kid or being the person who's not fast, just telling themselves a different story. Well, what if you were, what if right now, like the healthiest version of you is, is already in there. It's just removing the parts of you that aren't healthy to find them. I equate it to, to Michelangelo and they asked him like, how do you see that statue of David in, in that marble? And he says, well, the statue's always been there. I'm just removing the parts that aren't the statue. Uh... And that applies to us finding our healthiest higher self is the things, the trauma that doesn't serve us, the habits that don't serve us, that programming, the 50% of our subconscious programming is laid in by the time we're seven years old and yeah. understanding where those original wounds are will help us address them with compassion and learn to love ourselves and be a, a better healed version of ourselves that's already in there. I think this is, I just realized why this work that you do is so valuable because at the end of the day, what we're asking people to do, we're telling them that they need to learn how to do is to create a new identity. And I don't think there's real playbooks in, in our culture and society in the fitness industry to create a new identity. It's like, just do it, just become this fit person. And it's like, all right, if I just eat this way and exercise this way, I'll become this person. That's why I love the book Atomic Habits and these other books that really help people shift their perception of themselves, shift their mindset and learn how to create a new identity. Because at the end of the day, that's what it requires. If you want to become like a new version of you, this most healed version of you, you're going to have to let go of these old versions that hold you back and uh, in a sense, let them die off and be rebirthed a, a new version of you. And that's scary. It's hard because the brain will seek the, the discomfort of um, butchering this quote already. <laughs> Your brain will be, it will seek the discomfort of what what it knows versus the um, discomfort of the unknown and so what i'm saying is people will be stuck in a miserable cycle because it's familiar versus let me try something new and they, they, they're so afraid of the unknown that they, they won't ever venture out even though they're miserable and stuck where they are they're more comfortable the brain will seek comfort there because it knows the discomfort it doesn't know the discomfort of the unknown yet it could be worse it could be better and a lot of people don't know how to make that jump. And so I think this is the value of what you bring to the table with this assessment and your book is giving people a roadmap of like, here's your old identity. Here's your new identity of who you're trying to become. Here's a roadmap of how to get there and rewiring your brain, your neuro, your neural pathways, creating new ones to help you create that new identity in a sense. And that's kind of the way I see what you do. Yeah. And that's a good way to put it. I, I always mm -hmm. equate it to like whenever... I last year in June, because I wanted to do something every year. I do something that I, that terrifies me that I don't think I'm able to do, but I sign up for it and then I'm able to do it. Yeah. So last, last <laughs> June, I swam 12 and a half miles around Key West, Florida. Wow. And I didn't, the, the furthest I'd swam before that was 2.4. I've done, I've done eight Ironmans, but I've never swam that far. Yeah. And Whenever I first got in triathlon, uh, 2008, I didn't know how to swim. I dog paddled my first two triathlons out in Carlsbad, California. And I tell people it's like the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. Like I'm stumbling on the beach, I'm vomiting, like there's loud noises going off everywhere. I don't know what the hell I was doing. Yeah. But my repetition, my repetition, I learned how to swim. So mm -hmm. we can use repetition to do things that we want and that's how we learn. Now, we also, that's how we pick up bad habits is by repetition. So if you wake up every morning and look at your phone before you get out of bed, that's the same as going to swim a thousand meters in the pool. 
every day yep. because you're, you're strengthening that neural circuit in your brain. Yeah. And this happens on so many things that we're unaware of. Like what, if I were to ask someone, hey, who goes to bed at night and says, man, I cannot wait to wake up and check my phone before I get out of bed. No one says that, but we do it. And so, yeah. and so having the awareness of where we've got these neural pathways uh, wired gives us the ability to then say, okay, I, I, I say the difference, that's habit, that's habit energy. When we're on autopilot, I say, let's establish ritual. What do you want your morning to look like? If you were to write out and map your day, what do you want? Because how many people have done that? Have said, okay, when I wake up, this is what I want to do with my day. And don't make yeah. it outcome oriented, make it process oriented. Yep. You're only as, uh, what does he say? You're, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Yeah. And, a- and, and atomic habits. Yeah. And that's what I love is like people don't have the system set up. They have the goals and the ambitions and like the, the results they want to get there. But they don't have the the system. You fall to the level of your systems, the processes that you have in place. Am I right? Yeah, and and I want to point something out about goals too, because the goals aren't what people think they are. So, yeah. Drew, like like, so, what's a goal you have right now? Let's see. Um, let's do a a physical one. Um, well, well, right now I'm paddling, which is um, I, I don't really have a goal for that yet necessarily. But let's say right now my goal is to let's say pay off debt. I say I have okay. some debt and I need to pay off debt. How will you feel once you've paid off that debt? Ooh, that feeling of a weight being taken off, um, less, less, less of a burden on me, freedom. That, yeah, that I, the feeling is what I'm desiring. Is that what you're getting to? Like, that's th- that's, that's what I want. It's not the goal. Yeah. It's the feeling the goal gives me. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and this is really important to point out, especially we're talking about fitness and health. Because yeah. this is why once people lose that weight, they yo-yo back because that feeling like, oh, I feel so fulfilled. Well, that feeling fades. And so once it fades and you don't have something to anchor or you're not present in the moment, and this is why it's because people don't, and this is why re- reframing your story is so important. Because if you don't think that's you, if you're mimicking somebody with 8% body fat, instead of realizing that's who you are, then you yeah. go back to the old you. And the, the feeling, again, just like when I say when you're chasing happiness, feelings fade. So once you pay off the debt, how are you going to feel freedom? And this is where I really help people with like values mapping and purpose. Mm-hmm. I have a class called Living with Purpose. What, what, I think of the scene from The Notebook where, where uh, he's like, what do you <laughs> what want? Do you want? Like, like, what do you want? Like getting real clear about yeah. what you want in life. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I know we're coming up on time, Ramsey. I do want to uh, just give a little bit of time to allow people to, if they do want to take this assessment, work on, I definitely want to send people to this assessment because I think this is a good place to get started. If any of you struggle with understanding yourself and how you respond in stressful situations and how you're looking to respond, this assessment I think is a great place for everyone to get started. Also, uh, the book, um, uh, Cake on the Floor, uh, that's available on Amazon. That's correct. Cake on the Floor, uh, right here. There you go. Yes, available on Amazon. How to handle life's unexpected moments with resilience and grace. The other thing about the ELI that I didn't mention, Drew, is if yeah. a company has a team take it, when I average the results oh. together, it it shows the company their culture. That's very, very valuable. Very smart too. Yeah. It shows yeah. like overall your company's just putting out fires all day or overall it's toxic positivity. Like everyone's running around saying, no, 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 we've got this. But deep down, they really don't feel like they've got mm. this, but that's helpful. But for anyone interested to take the ELI, whether it's one-on-one or as a company, uh, my website, Bergeron Wellbeing, B-E-R-G-E-R-O-N, wellbeing.com, and then slash ELI, bergeronwellbeing.com slash ELI. And if they're a fan of yours or w- following your podcast, if they use Promo code Drew at checkout, they'll get 10% off. Sweet. Uh, thank you so much for that, Rams. Yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes for everyone. If you guys want to, do want to take this assessment, you're curious about it. For me, it was super helpful. And like I like you said, I do plan on doing this every, once every six months because life situations you know, change and evolve over time. And I think it's important to know where you're at now instead of thinking you're always going to be stuck uh, that version of you, because you should always be growing and evolving and changing, uh, you know, as we know better, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but once you know better, you can do better. And that's why this, I think this podcast and your assessment and your book are going to help so, so many people reach that level of self-awareness that, you know, it, it's, it's a never ending process. I will say this, you guys, this journey of 
of self-improvement in a sense is is it's there's no destination there's no finish line <laughs> this is like a journey that never ends there's always work to be done and it, everything comes at a cost it's not good or bad and that's what i love working with this guy he's helped me out so much in my personal life professional life with this assessment and with this this the new shift in mindset so ramsey i just want to say thank you man for what you do thank you for coming on uh, we might have you back on again in the future just because i think there's a lot that we didn't cover in this episode um, so stay tuned for that. But any last words, Ramsey, you want to leave with the audience? Gosh, man, put me on the spot. No, I, I really yeah. appreciate you, Drew. I, I will. So um, I yeah. there's a real I share with people to help get them motivated. So 10 birds are sitting on a wire and five decide to fly away. How many okay. are left on the wire? Five. I'm like doing simple math here, but I, I think that's wrong. It is wrong. 10. 10 are ten. left. Oh, that's true. Yeah, there's 10 that are left. Total. Well, 10 yeah, birds yeah. are sitting on a wire. Five decide to fly away. How many are left? Yeah, there's still 10. Why? Right? Because like some are on a different path, but they're all there. They're just no, on... because five decided to fly away doesn't mean they did anything. Oh, that's true. So okay, just because you are decided to make changes in your life, like, oh, I've decided to get in shape. Great. What have you done? Well, I'm going to join. Oh, you're going to join. You haven't done anything. Mm. So essentially, talk is cheap. The only thing that you can stand like on are your actions. It's like uh, Tony Robbins quote, you know, knowledge is potential power. Knowledge isn't power, it's potential power. <laughs> you know, you yeah. can have the knowledge, but putting it into practice, you know, uh, is, is a whole different ball game. So yeah. love it, Ramsey. Okay, well, yeah. we'll put a link to the show notes, uh, a link in the show notes for the book, for the assessment as well with a promo code Drew at checkout. You guys can go do that assessment. Let me know what you think about it. Um, I think it'll be really powerful for a lot of people. So Ramsey. Seriously. So glad we met on the plane, man. Grateful for you. Let me know when you come out here. We'll we'll go for a 12 mile swim. For sure, right? All because of a broken seat on the plane. We didn't even tell the story. I know. Of why. Oh yeah. man. The broken seat. That was so yeah. funny. The poor lady in front of you. Okay. You guys will have to stay tuned for the, the full story. Well, maybe we'll do a, an Instagram live when this episode airs and we'll we'll share that story. That sounds good. Drew, thank you okay. so much, brother. I appreciate you. Glad we met our, our paths crossed for a reason. Looking forward to, to what the future brings. Okay. Take care. We'll talk soon. Aloha. Hey.